Good evening, everyone. My name is Peggy Connor, and I'm so delighted to be here with you in such a really nice um, crowd here, and there's some people joining us on Zoom. I'm a member of SAG Moraine, which is a native plant community of basically all volunteers. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and there is a brochure there um, that kind of describes some of our basic things, but I'm gonna go through a little bit here tonight as well. But our topic tonight is native plants, why they're important and how to include them um, in your everyday garden. We're, <clears throat> there's a lot of groups out there that was just mentioned and they take a, a, a stronger you know, um, attitude about things that have to be particular. We don't offer any kind of certification. We're just doing, we're an education and advocacy program that's just encouraging people to plant native in their own yards. So um, our motto here is restoring our environment one plant at a time. So that basically says that we don't need a, a whole yard, but to start with one plant. Well, start with three. <laughs> <laughs> And who we are is our mission is to advocate for the use of native plants in residential, commercial, and public landscapes. And, um, and that is moving, we're, we're a relatively new organization, but actually we just planted two gardens on um, Saturday and one at Tinley Park and one at their Environmental Enhancement Commission at their Village Hall and one at the Burbank Library, Prairie Trails Library. So yeah, so we're getting, trying to be, um, cohesive and collusive and uh, get together with different organizations and help them out. But we do believe that native plants are the foundation of our food chain and must become more widely utilized to improve the ecosystems that sustain life. And we also strive to provide a fun, friendly and welcoming environment for all who share our commitment. So what we do is exactly why I'm here. In person and online learning opportunities, as I mentioned, our website is on the brochure. Um, you can check us out and go on the website. And we do have webinars, maybe a little bit slower in the summer, but usually every four to six weeks during the winter on um, Wednesday evenings, which really with really high level guests. So, and it's for nothing, you know, it's for free. So you don't have to worry about some webinars you have to pay. No, this is um, a gratis. So we also do community outreach, as I just mentioned. We try and help. Um, people that are interested in obtaining and selecting native plants that might be good for their particular garden. We look at projects oversight and sponsorship, and we're just tip, dipping our toes into nature appreciation experiences for children. We haven't gotten someone in that wants to teach kids yet, but we're working on getting a volunteer that wants to develop a program for that. So native plants are basically the foundation of our healthy ecosystem. So this first half of the presentation, I'm gonna talk about the why it's important to plant native. And the second half is about the plants that you can have in an urban or suburban landscape that are um, conducive to your neighbors, yourself, your town. So um, an ecosystem basically is a geographic area where plants, animals, organisms, are all interconnected. I'm gonna leave native plant for last. A non-native plant is one that's been introduced with human help, intentionally or accidentally. So a lot of our non-natives have come from Europe or Asia. And many from Europe were intentionally planted and brought over. Uh, some from Asia now are coming in on our barge, you know, seed and something, and it really spreads rapidly. <clears throat> um, a weed is a plant, native or non-native, that is not valued. So it can be native, but it's a native weed. It's not a valued plant. And, but most weeds are non-native. So and great, and thank you. A native plant is one that is part of the balance of nature that's developed over hundreds or thousands of years in a particular region. Okay. Sorry, okay. Return, use return. So be patient. I'm very <laughs> computer. So I have Kelly Jean helping me. Um, so thanks for being patient with me. Sorry. Can you talk about non native weeds? Yes. Oh, no, I'm not going to talk about them specifically, but um, 
and it, it, weeds are basically unwanted, you know, and I'll show you a lot of native plants which are taken for weeds okay. because they're, they were in the prairie there, but I'm gonna specifically talk about beautiful, well-rounded, well-mounded plants, not that will take over your garden. Invasive, you don't want invasive plants, whether or not they're native or non-native, because you want to be able to control yes. what is in. Now, there's a few that you might want to spread, and I'll encourage that, but most of the time you don't want invasive plants in your <laughs> gardens. So more native plants basically give, it's, it's all about our ecosystem, and they're the foundation of our ecosystem, and they, um, we need a healthy ecosystem with abundant native plants. We need abundant beneficial bugs and pollinators. And in order to have that, you have to have native plants because our bugs and pollinators will not um, go towards non-natives or, or uh, cultivar plants. And I'll describe that in a bit. Abundant birds, it's, it, it helps us with a balanced food chain, um, abundant production of edible fruits. This is all native plants are responsible for. Improved air quality and reduced carbon, more purified water, they actually do that. And um, less erosion of soil. So it's a balanced ecosystem. With less native plants, it's basically an unhealthy ecosystem. Flu few, excuse me, few beneficial bugs and pollinators, few birds. We've lost 3 billion birds in this country since 1970. Pretty dramatic. Our insect, we're in an insect apocalypse, which I will describe later. It is radically um, changing and not for the good. So that's why we're coming out and trying to educate people about the importance of each individual doing it. We cannot no longer let our government just do forest preserve or natural lands. It has to be each individual person taking responsibility in order to bring our ecosystem back in balance where we can. And some things we have no control over, but we can control some things. So therefore then it's an unbalanced food chain and then production deficiency, reduced air quality, poor quality water, et cetera. So this is a really great quote. <clears throat> and I beg your pardon for my fogginess today. Um, but Sarah Stein, this is on our homepage, we cannot in fairness rail against those who destroy the rainforest or threaten the spotted owl when we have made our own yards, our own backyards and front yards uninhabitable. So we need pollinators. We know why and, and we need those to pollinate our plants to have a healthy ecosystem. Pollinators need native plants. More than 150 food crops in the US depend on pollination. Pollination is the key to production of oxy oxygen. Pollinated plants sequester carbon. They purify water and prevent erosion. Um, they return moisture to the atmosphere and our pollinators include butterflies, moths, flies, beetles, <laughs> sometimes things you don't want to believe that, but they are great pollinators, bees and birds. But by far, out of all of them, bees are the most efficient pollinators. So I want to talk a little bit about bees right now because we have... Um... Oh, if you just click in yet, it's just not nice. Okay. Oops. Yes, would you mind? I, I, I have to go back to that. Oh, we have to see. I have a mouse at home. Oh, yeah. Must so, see. so let's go So we need to go back. One more. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a lovely person here that's going to help me from for those at home that because I'm really computer. Computer <laughs> <laughs> developmentally dumb. Um, so there's two kinds of bees that we really think about most often, and that's the honeybee and the native bee. The honeybee is what we most commonly see here, and that is really the European honeybee. That is not native to the United States. That was brought up over from Europe to um, to poll help pollinate. Um, that's okay. I think everybody got in, got in right. right. Okay. We should be good. We just got a couple phone calls that people oh, okay. weren't getting All through. Right. So we just want to make sure. All right. So for those who are just joining us, welcome. We were just basically talking about the need um, for native plants. We're just beginning in the need for um, bees and pollination. 
sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Um, yes yeah. yeah, sorry so again honeybees are non-native it came from europe they were they're right now in industrial bee farming we need them because that is who european honeybees pollinated most of our crops now basically by bee farming but bee farming in the big white boxes you see up there is very susceptible to colony collapse and we've all heard it it's been in the news the colony collapse of honeybees um they live in aggressive colonies and they compete with native bees for food. So you don't wanna mess with a honeybee when they're on the move. But a native bee, that's very, very interesting about our native bees in the United States. Most of them are solitary. They don't have hives. Bumblebees do have small underground hives, but most of them are solitary. They are peaceful and rarely sting. They Many native bees don't even have a stinger. And we have a really um, sort of a, uh, you know, fear of bees and we, but that's the honeybee or the yellow jacket wasp. Right. Those are the ones that really are, are difficult. Um, they need native plants in order to reproduce. And habitat loss has caused the Midwest to lose half of its native bees this century. And the interesting thing is native bees are at least three times more effective at pollination than honeybees, but we've destroyed them. Um, do we still have some? Yes, and we're working on increasing that. Okay. No, I, fuzzy ones. Those, the real fuzzy ones, the big ones, are usually bumblebees, and they are native. And I always I have a great joke because I'm, I said, you can outrun a, if I can outrun a bumblebee, you can outrun a bumblebee. <laughs> <laughs> because they just are interested in foraging. I have gone into plants and put my hand in there. They're really, they just, you know, they're, unless you step on them or, you know, they're not going to hurt you. And they're just so cute and boom, 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 boom. That's basically what they are. So this is an example of a mason bee. And you can see a mason bee right on um, one of our, our volunteers um, fingers. I just, I, I purchased some mason bees and have them and then just let, let them open up and they came in my house, they were crawling up my arms. They do not, they're just peaceful critters. This is one type of native bee, mason bee. Leaf cutter bees are other um, very um, peaceful native bees. There's quite a few out there, but we, we don't have. Is no, it is black, is you know, black? There, but there's other subspecies which have a little yet more yellow in them. But the ones um, that I've seen recently are, they almost kind of look like a big fly, uh -huh. kind of, I mean, without the wings, you know, but yeah. But, and they're, they're rather large, you know, so they're... Are there more birds in certain areas of the warmer, warmer states? Or? No, they're just being annihilated all over. And that's basically due to our, our practices in the United States. And insecticides or what? Yes. And we're going to, I think that's the next slide. So this is just, no, that's okay. No, I love this. Um, this is just a list of some of the foods that the bees pollinate. So without bees, you know, pollinating, we would not have these foods. They, they just wouldn't be there. So insects need native plants to breed and feed and our food chain depends on insects. I think our slide's gonna come up with, it's gonna address your question. If not, I'll answer it. So again, the whole world's insect population is plummeting. It has declined 30% um, in three decades. So you can see just recently, since we're talking, you know, a hundred years to 30 years to 1970. I mean, it's just been the last, 50 years of dramatic decline. Uh, uh, were the yeah. most of that though in the Amazon jungle where the insects are disappearing? Oh, they're disappearing there rapidly because of the habitat is changing. They're cutting down the trees. This basically is information talking about yeah. here and okay. Europe and hasn't even addressed the Amazon issue, quite frankly. I don't know what it's gonna look like in another 10 years because they can monitor this stuff, which they weren't able to do for a while too. Um, the monarch butterfly is a really interesting, it's a poster child for insect decline. It's a beautiful orange and black butterfly. It is our state butterfly as well. And Illinois, it's very interesting because in the migration of the monarch, the monarch 
travels our entire state. It's the only state that goes from, it goes from the north, from Minnesota and Wisconsin, all the way down Illinois to then, then starts diagonally going to Mexico. And Illinois until 2017, this is very recently, had banned milkweed in the state of Illinois. And uh, it's now been, that has been removed. Thank you. Why and they it? Well, you know, people, it, it, I don't want to just say it's the farmers all the time or this or that, but it can be, it, it can be invasive and in that you have to look at it when it's in your garden, but it doesn't spread usually into the fields, but it's surrounding the fields and it, it, it blows. It's, it, it's sort of like a dandelion, how that little oh, yeah. furry stuff is. And then there's a big seeds, pot of seeds in there and they, and they blow, but they're easy to pull up. They're not, but for some reason, somebody got on the bandwagon and banned milk. And that is a big part of the decline of the monarch butterfly. They could not feed for, what is it, 500 miles down Illinois. So um, that's all gone. So we're planting milkweed like crazy. And it's actually a beautiful plant. I'm gonna show you that. Now, uh, does, the, does the monarch butterfly do anything for the environment? Yes, we're gonna get into that too. <laughs> <laughs> and they've declined 90% in recent years. There's only 10% monarch butterflies left in the world, in the world. So because they overwinter in Mexico. Right. Uh, so again, you know, some of you will remember, some might not. When we, you walked into your backyard and you saw fireflies and lightning bugs, I, you, you might see it out here a little bit more in New Lenox and that. You saw, you, I used to see a caterpillar cross it. I lived in the city and the caterpillars would, you know, cross the sidewalk. Moss were always around the street lights. You looked up at a street light, it was just, yeah. you drove your car and you had, you had to clean your windshields. Yes. Very seldom do you have to clean your windshields anymore. And these are the, not the Asian beetles, lady, these are the true ladybugs. They're, they're um, very much declining and we need them to keep our uh, insects like aphids under control that really can damage plants. And this is kind of a roly poly, which actually goes through all the soil and removes a lot of the waste and we don't see those anymore. They're just, I mean, you do, but they're very rare. It's hard to find them. So this is your question. What is causing this insect apocalypse? Sorry. Um, basically lawn, chemical and pesticide use. And I'll just briefly talk about lawns. Lawns were brought over by the Europeans. If you had extra land, we early, you know, eight, 17th, 18th, 19th century, people didn't have lawns. They used their property to grow food. Um, the wealthy had lawns. Yes. So it was the desire to, you know, mobile, upward mobility to have lawns. And so when we, it, it basically it happened in, in, in the 20s, 30s and 40s that lawns became more popular, but they were kind of post, postage stamp lawns. Um, when the great suburban migration happened and post um, World War II, Scott's fertilizer came up with how you control weeds and fertilize. And that's when, boom, for, you know, because nobody's going to go out and pick the analines, you know, by hand, but they had, a, you know, they discovered uh, a fertilizer that uh, controlled weed. So that's, and it kills everything. It, it just kills everything in the soil. And that's where a lot of insects overwinter and live. So the other thing is habitat loss. Again, in our natural lands, um, there's, we're very fortunate in this area to have the forest preserves we have, the Will County, DuPage County, and yeah. Cook County Forest Preserves. But if you start noticing what's going on in the forest preserve, and you'll notice it in spring, especially before anything is emerging, you're going to see these beautiful white trees in the forest preserves. They do not belong there. They're calorie pairs. They are invasive. They're destructive. They don't support a single insect. And we have them all over because landscapers, I had it too. I mean, I'm not condemning anybody. Please don't take it like that. I am probably the mass murderer of the Southwest side. I had calorie pears. I had pesticides. I had Mosquito Joe come into my house, you know, so, um, so don't do what I used to do. Bradford pears is the same th yeah. family of calorie pears. Calorie pears, Bradford pears, pears trees. 
Yeah, the the beautiful white. See the the, the pear shaped conical. Well, landscapers love them, and because they grow fast. So I'll tell you a quick story. When I I looked out my front door one day, and I had just had like an illness or whatever, and I saw this this beautiful foliage out there on my front porch. I said, oh, how nice. Somebody sent me a beautiful plant, you know? I opened up the door. It was my cal my pear tree <laughs> and had storm before because they're very soft wood. They're very dense. And if you get the right wind, they will crack and fall. So um, that's what happened to my calorie tree. So it's, um, there. I encourage, and I encourage no one to plant them. They are banned in several states now. And um, Missouri, I think, is a new one. I think it's South Carolina, a few other states, um, because they are invasive. The birds carry this, the, the little uh, fruits and dump them all in our forest preserves, and they take over. And so you'll see these white trees. They have no, they don't belong in our forest preserves. They're invasive trees. So um, that's introduced invasive uh, plant species. And of course, our habitat loss is because we're a growing nation and we're taking over more and more land. And we have, especially out here in suburbs, you see even corporations with massive amounts of lawn yes. and land around their buildings. Yes. So um, that's just what causing it. So if you're fertilizing that and putting pesticides on it, you will reduce insect population. All right, so this is Jonas Salk, who actually was Dr. Jonas Salk, the polio guy. And he said, if all insects on earth disappeared within 50 years, all life on earth would end. If all human beings disappeared from the earth within 50 years, all forms of life would flourish. Isn't that something? So now we're gonna talk a little bit about birds and they're usually a better topic because people like birds and they're beautiful and they sing and they fly around and insects and bees and stuff like that are, um, it's, it's a harder sell, but, <laughs> but it's an important sell. Um, so birds, um, basically they provide essential services. They destroy um, agricultural insects. They keep them in check. They also pollinate flowering plants mostly, prevention of disease through waste removal. You don't see a lot of, even you walk through a forest preserve, you don't see a lot of dead critters in there. The birds will remove them. So it, they really, I never knew that until recently, you know, I mean, until the last couple of years, I went, oh yeah, you know, and you have to watch it with roadkill because you'll see hawks and crows and, you know, vultures coming down. They also spread seeds and restore our ecosystem because of they spread a lot of seeds. And they help to store carbon and keep our climate stable by sustaining our natural landscapes. So we need birds, birds need insects, and insects need native plants. So it all goes back down to native plants. And why do birds need insects? Because birds need butterfly and moth caterpillars to raise their young. They cannot feed them seed. A baby bird cannot eat seed. So they have caterpillars of moss and butterflies, which are soft, high in nutrients. Mama takes them and feeds them. Um, they're the most important food source, source for nesting birds. And Doug Tallamy, who wrote Nature's Best Hope over there, the leading entomologist in the United States, um, says it takes six to 9,000 caterpillars to feed one clutch wow. of chickadees. Wow. So they get a lot of them off of the trees that we don't even see, um, see what they're doing. A lot of moth caterpillars and butterflies. So they need a lot, but we didn't have a problem with just the birds feeding off of that. We have a problem because we don't have enough native plants for them to, um, for caterpillars and more moths to reproduce on. And so there's, that's limited. It's not the birds all eating them. But you know, I've noticed that I've been here about the last 22 years or so. Mm -hmm. I, I live right near the library. And I used to hear a lot of birds. Right. They really, they were, they were very loud. Mm -hmm. I still hear them, but not as much. Right, right. They are at a big decline, 3 billion in the last, since 1970. Yeah. That's a big decline. And it's not really 
it is stopping. So there is good news. So don't, I'm not talking about all the bad news and we're gonna get into the good news. So basically the native plants are the foundation of the food chain. So we can see here native plants, uh, insects need native plants, crops need insects, humans need crops and crops, uh, livestock needs crops. The birds need native plants, the birds, the herbivores and the carnivores eat. So it's all interconnected. But if you see the bottom of the food chain, it's native plants. So here's the, the switch. What can we do? And we can all do something. So the theme of this is plant native, <laughs> native plants, plant native. So I, I'm just showing pictures of how beautiful they are because most people don't even understand how the beauty of native plants. They just think they're spindly weed like things. So they're very beautiful. And when we go into this next section, please feel free to take notes or to do a screenshot if you want a particular um, information on a particular plan as we go. You know, just, just do whatever you'd like. Um, they're essential to our ecosystem. They're very easy to care for once they're established. They require less water than anything else. After two or three years, you don't have to, it's basically, unless we're in a drought, you I can rely on your rainy, uh, your rainfall. They're designed for our climate. They developed here and they're adapted for our hard clay soil. <laughs> so they do well. So these are a few examples. Now, uh, isn't goldenrod what people are allergic to? No, goldenrod has gotten the bad rap of, oh, really? it's, it's sneeze weed that actually is, uh, oh. yeah, goldenrod, that's for some reason, because it's out in the fall, especially when the hay fever, you know, just correlated with the hay fever of the fall hay fever and they thought it was um no it's not that's that's a rumor it's not it has i, I promise you goldenrod is fine uh, everybody else is nice and then you yeah see stuff like yeah yeah like it. yeah it's called sneeze weed actually that's and it's a native but it's you don't want to plant that in <laughs> ragweed is another type of sneeze weed plant uh -huh. yep not goldenrod it's ragweed and sneeze weed okay all right, so this is a really useful uh, website. It's uh, National Wildlife Federation, nwf.org. Say it again. NWF, National yeah. Wildlife. Yeah, I'm going to drop this in the chat. Sure. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. Dot org. Slash native plant. Native plant finder. I can't read this. Thank you. Right here. Okay, this is so cool because you can find native plants, find butterflies, and you can develop a list. And all you have to do is drop in your zip code. It's just an easy, easy website. I so I wish when I met the, when I met the um, nursery, because mm -hmm. so few, right. you know, they're not like commercially successful yes. plants or whatever. Yes. And I was like, ah, I wish that I just could find the search engine. Yeah, this is a great search engine. And you'll find the butterflies and the host plants, the native plants that are host plants for the butterfly and the caterpillars. And it, it's amazing. I have had uh, milkweed and last year I brought some of the caterpillars in the house and I raised them and released them. And it was just, uh, they start with a little egg and then they get, it'll be like minuscule and then they become fat things that just eat all the time. Eat, 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 eat. You have to bring your milkweed in and feed, put them in there. Eat, eat, eat. Do some nursery actually carry to your plants? Uh, very few of them. They're getting, uh, and what I would suggest to everybody at, when we are on this topic is that when you go into one of your nurseries, even though if you know that there's nothing there, ask them, do you have any native plants? Because it's the public's demand which makes anything work. Um, well, County on Larry Road, they have a sale every spring on their native plants. Yes. It's, uh, yes. Bull County has a great. Yeah. It's going to be in Romeoville. I think it's online, so that you can take a look at that. Yeah, that, I can I search like there. There, I went to one like two weeks ago, and um, like up closer to Pensdale, or like I'd search for them online. Okay, we had one two weeks ago at at Marine Valley 
community college. So, um, but the, one of the issues with native plants and growers is that we did plant packages. So it would be like 18 plants to do in a corner of your garden or something like that. And then we did other plants at the sale. But you have to ask the grow the growers have to start growing them by March 1st. So they're not going to, just like any business, they're not going to grow something that they're not going to be able to sell. So one of the problems is you got to get the order in and then it takes until June. And a lot of people, Mother's Day is sort of our planting season in this area. And and they're waiting and waiting and, you know, we're in June and they're going, oh my goodness, I'm a month late on my plants and stuff. So, um, but that's the only way we're going to ever get it. Now, there are some online nurseries, Prairie Moon and Prairie Nurseries are two good ones that you can get native plants from. I know and, the Possibility Place is out south near Marine. Um, they're not retail, like you can't go in there. No, we shop. buy our, they're wholesaler, yeah. yeah. But they have, you can, uh, normal people can, Consumers can go online. So yes. Can't go in and shop, but, and I know yeah. they sell like, I think they have like a $99 starter. Yes, they do. They also, you can buy uh, 18 flat and mix and match. Now, when we buy from them, we buy purse by flat, like Anissa have a whole, you know, we can only buy by the flat. But for consumers, they will mix and match. So, but you have to buy a minimum of 18 plants. You can't shop and go, I need, I, I only want five plants. Right. So that's one of the things with them. Um, but more and more people are getting involved in it. So we're hoping that, you know, over the next few years, but Possibility Place is great plants, you know, but if you can get 18 together, which is not a lot, if you, you know, decide to mm -hmm. put them around your yard um, mm -hmm. or share them with your neighbors, mm -hmm. which is what we want you to talk about. Tell your neighbors. Um, Okay, one of the most important things to have in your gardens are keystone plants and every ecosystem has to have keystone plants in order to survive. So we're gonna show a few keystone plants in our area. First of all, it's the mighty oak. You can't believe the oak is, has uh, 456 species of insects in its beautiful canopy. It is the most prolific, wonderful thing you can have. Now, most people can't do it on their backyard or something, you can have it possibly in your parkway or something, but that is our keystone plant. It's just wonderful. Plum cherry trees, willow trees, not weeping willow trees, pure willow trees, a birch tree, red maple, goldenrod, solidago, which is not, not, they're not allergic. It's a keystone, so it's a great plant. Sunflowers, sunflowers, um, are, get very tall, but they're they're so um, worthwhile, and they're trying to. We're not doing cultivars, but there is one um, perennial that's a little bit smaller, more like three feet, um, that you can look for. Helianthus helio heliothosis, I think it's called. Um, but sunflowers are just the pollinators love them, and then the birds love the seeds. Is that, is that those are the grass? That's dandelion. The dandelion's the yellow. No, I've oh. got a little strawberries in my grass. Oh, the, yeah. Oh, it could be in could be in your grass. I don't know if it's your wild strawberry or it could oh, be. Wild yeah. yeah. You know what? There is a thing called um, PlantNet. It's a free service that you can download and take a picture of some things, and they will tell you try and tell you what it is. So that's a useful tool. Um, I can't, I'm not a, a, a botanist, so I wish I could help you be more specific. I actually do have some advice on that okay. one in particular. Um, wild strawberries, true wild strawberries have the seeds on the outside. You can kind of see in the picture there that they pop out, but the false ones tend to be, and they also kind of hide their, their berries in their leaves. Uh, the false strawberries are going to be a little bit more out of their leaves. They kind of pop out. They're easy to see. And those seeds are going to be a little bit more rounded, almost like a raspberry. Like you're going to see them a lot more on the outside there. They won't be those little crevices. So that's one way to tell. Uh, the fall strawberries are a little bit more resilient. So if you're seeing them growing in your lawn after like mowing and things like that, you probably have fall strawberries. They're not edible though. <laughs> no, um, so the, no. <laughs> the wild strawberries, their fruit will get a little bit bigger, but the false ones will stop at about that size. See, 
We learn something all the time. Thank you so much, Kelly Jean. That's just about the only You know, I'm not I'm not as familiar with that. Okay, let's just go on false indigo and lead plant, which is on the bottom here in Joe Pie. These are all keystone plant species in our area. So very um, useful. And they're essential for the ecosystem. I mean, they're just, I'll go back. Every ecosystem is certain species. I'm going to read this. That's an oak leaf. Yeah. Yeah. Are they? Oh, yes. They go up volunteering everybody's fields and they're trying their best to get rid of them. Well, I hope they don't. I mean, it's not. Well, I didn't know they were invasive. I didn't think they were invasive, but I, I could be wrong on that. But that is one of the issues. But if we ban these things, it'll be like the monarch. We will. The, the farmers um, have the, the largest voice in, in Illinois. So. Um, I would just suggest you don't have to put 8,000 Joe Pye weeds in your yard and, and, and tick off your farm, farmer neighbors, but you know, it still is essential and it, they're absolutely gorgeous. So we'll have a picture of those a little bit. So now, the, the farmers, I mean, they're very strong, but is there an outreach to get them educated as to why they shouldn't do stuff? That's kind of what I'm trying to do. <laughs> but I'm our, all these organizations are what the problem is is what we don't know. It's not that people, you know, want to hurt the environment generally. It's they don't know. The average homeowner doesn't know that you can plant natives. No. They go to the lawn and garden shop and right. they plant right. whatever's there. And um, and they make a lot more money on annuals and perennials are declining, even cultivar perennials, because they come back year after year. Right. And the you know the Home Depots and the Lowe's of this world want you to buy annuals, so you right. buy. And, yeah, the perennials are always more expensive. Yeah. Than the now, I think. Yeah, and they're harder to find. Yeah. They're harder to find than they were even ten years ago, where it was perennial, because they don't die; they come back year after year. So. Even though there was, some of them have a shorter lifespan, just like the native plants. I mean, not a lifespan, a bloom time. Mm -hmm. So, um, anyways, so let's let's just go back to because I've got a lot of. I'm going to probably go through these pretty quickly because there's a lot of slides. Uh, this is. I just want to show you how beautiful they are. Blue false indigo. It's a bush-like perennial, three to five feet. It's perfect for a formal garden because it's upright. Uh, full to part sun blooms June and July, and it's loved by pollinators and hummingbirds. When I put caterpillar host plant, that is what caterpillars, butterflies and their caterpillars can only be laid on host plants. They will not lay their eggs on cultivars and other plants that are not specific to them. So that's why we need native plants too for our caterpillars, which become our butterflies and our caterpillars feed the birds. And this is also a keystone plant. Deer resistant, believe it or not, most native, most native plants are deer resistant, not rabbit resistant, but, <laughs> but, but deer resistant. So if you're have plagued by deer, it's a, they're, they're great. Butterfly weed is basically a no, it has all these na names, I don't know who ever, let's look at the Latin, it's really cool Latin names, but not so butterfly weed. Oh yeah, I want five of those, you know, because it has weed in it, it scares people off. But this is a host plant to the endangered monarch butterfly. The butterfly weed and the milkweed are the two host plants for, and I'll show you a swamp milkweed in a little bit. This has bright orange flowers. It's a showy specimen, it grows about two feet tall. Um, dry, well-strained soil, and it thrives in full sun. And it just attracts pollinators and butterflies. And it's, again, host plant. Has a pretty long bloom season, June, July, and August. Um, native columbine is really a very versatile plant because it's a bell-like tubular flower, red. There's only a few native um, plants that are red. There's uh, My favorite color is blue and lavenders. And a lot of annuals aren't that color except petunias and stuff. And I was really amazed when the native plants are that one of my favorite colors, um, but they don't have a lot of red for some reason. Um, blooms May and June. It's an early bloomer for our early pollinators, one to three feet tall. The reason it's so adaptable, it can grow from full sun to shade. So that is really cool. 
host plant again and, and the hummingbirds love it and bees love it. <clears throat> Because some bees, the hummingbirds, of course, stick their long beak up there and they like that and they like red. But bees are so cute when they go into a tubular, especially bumblebees, because all you see, their head goes in and you see their little rear end and it's really cute. <laughs> they're really sweet. Um, Black-eyed Susan, um, they're bright, showy, easy to grow. This might be something that you want to monitor in your yard because this will expand, but they're easy to... Yeah, but not bad. I mean, it's not like invasive, like I would say, but they will, you can plant a couple of plants and then next year you might have six plants. So, I, I mean, I personally like that. <laughs> but if you don't like it, you can pull them out. So, and keep them, you know, tame. Um, they grow one to two feet tall. So they're very, you know, very garden lovely instead of being overwhelming. Uh, dry to medium soil, very drought tolerant. So this is nice. Again, bees, birds, uh, pollinators, butterflies, and also the seed heads um, feed birds in winter. And I've heard that they really, um, uh, the finches really love the seed heads of the black eyed Susans. So you would leave them out? Yes. In and I'm, so the birds can get it. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll interrupt that right now because I think it's important. I'm worried, a little bit worried about time. Do you, you know, I remember spring and fall what was that in our garden? Work, 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 work. <laughs> especially in fall when you're cutting back everything. Well, the best thing to do, especially with native plants, is let them go over winter. First of all, the bees and pollinators, other pollinators go into the stems and they make their homes. They overwinter in there. The, everything drops down from the, from the trees and they overwinter in your um, uh, soil. Um, the seed heads are wonderful for birds. You don't have to clean up in fall, you have to clean up in spring. So that eliminates a lot of work. Now you can make it tidier by clipping. I wouldn't cl clip seed heads ever, but some of them you could clip down a little bit to a one third if, you're, if they're annoying you. But to clip them down, you're eliminating a lot of pollinator habitat. So keep, I love that. Just spring clean up, that's all you have to do. Um, so, that's about there. This is a switchgrass, which is a really nice hedge, upright, three to six feet tall, and is a lovely autumn color. It has a seed heads in August and September. And um, so it's a really nice um, grassy hedge plant. Lead plant is a keystone plant in our area. Again, here's the beautiful blues and lavenders that I, I love, I'm biased, but it grows about two to three feet tall, full sun. It has an extremely long-lived woody shrub. So this is one of the few true shrubs of Illinois. So it's kind of cool. Blooms June and July, butterfly host plant. Foxglove beard's tongue, which is Penstemon digitalis, which don't, don't eat any of these flowers. Huh? <laughs> um, Again, they're smothered in white tubular flowers, so the bees love those. And it grows about two to three feet tall, um, full to part sun, June and July. And this is actually loved by specifically the native mason bee and bumblebees. So the two, two uh, species of our native bees. Um, prairie drop seed is a really sweet little grass because it's only two to four feet tall instead of getting some of the bigger, larger grasses, which there are many more if you want them, but we're talking about smaller space in our backyards and that. Um, so the flowering panicles appear in August and September. They have a, a pleasant fragrance and they're host plant again. And the birds will eat the seed heads over winter, just leave them. Um, Blazing blue star, I love this picture. I mean, who got this photograph is just, I mean, on the ground, just a spectacular photo. Um, it's again a native Illinois. Most of these are native Midwest, but these are a couple of, when I say specific Illinois, there's a few of them that are just only in, you know, native to Illinois. So um, this is beautiful spikes of uh, lavender flowers. Three, it's a taller plant, three to five feet tall, full sun. And it's a host plant for a very, very rare, it's called the glorious flower moth. Um, so um, you, you want to have those if you can. Little blue stem, again, is a highly or ornamental native grass, two to three feet tall, upright and densely mounded, 
um, a reddish brown color and false, which is nice to have different colors. Um, this is the only one that is not recommended for clay soil. So pay attention. If you're gonna put little blue stem and make sure you amend your soil really, really well and dig a large hole and put you know some compost in there and stuff. So it's not um, going in total clay. I just dug a hole the other day and it's clay, clay. Um, full sun, host plant for many butterflies. Um, wild geranium is another lovely kind of a ground cover. It's beautiful. You have love, lavender flowers in the early spring, uh, but it's foliage throughout the summer. So it's really can spread and have underneath your trees if you want um, uh, coverage. And, and the, the cool thing about ground covers and when you plant native plants, you wanna plant a lot of them. You don't have to weed as much. When we've planted in our yards lately, you know, we always plant a plant, then we have a lot of mulch, then we have another plant, then we have more mulch. Well, in between those spaces are where weeds grow. If you have plant after plant after plant, the weeds don't, can't get in there, or there's a few. I mean, it's not weed free, but a ground cover really, I had those for years and all I would see once in a while is a grass from the lawn that would, you know, the ribosomes of the grass would go in the bed and crop up, nothing, else in those geraniums. So one to two feet tall and a great spring pollinator. Again, you need pollinator of pollen and nectar for all the seasons, spring, uh, summer, fall. So that's why we encourage you to um, plant different plants for the seasons. Uh, Golden Alexander is another beautiful uh, yellow flower that you, you know sometimes see out there. One or two, do you? It's beautiful one to two feet tall, it's great. Now the other, no, not good for clay. This is great for heavy clay soils. So um, very low maintenance plant, loves, uh, uh, pollinators love it and it's a butterfly host plant. Um, this is a spectacular flower, New England aster. It's stunning when it's in bloom with it, that purple with the orange or yellow um, center. It, now this can grow three to six feet tall, but our recommendation is that in June, before it blooms, because it'll bloom um, in August, September, it's a late bloomer, you can cut the aster down halfway so it won't get to be five, six feet tall. Just cut it in half and then it'll rebloom. Um, it's a very important source of nectar for the late season pollinators and migration because a lot of hummingbirds migrate, um, our, a lot of our butterflies migrate, so you wanna have a lot of nectar plants. Okay, um, swamp milkweed, that's what I have a lot of. It's this beautiful pink flower. Again, it's a um, monarch butterfly um, uh, host plant. It's just a lovely showy flower. It's, a, um, it's loved of course by them and it blooms pretty long in June, July and August. So a nice three month bloom period. Uh, cardinal flower is a lovely, and it's the only other red flower around here. Um, it's of course irresistible to hummingbirds. They just flock to the red. It's a wetland plant. So it does like, if you have an area of your yard or something that you have, get a lot of moisture or soaking and it doesn't dry out, this is a great plant for that. And it's a self seeder. So it will die back, but it'll seed itself again. Uh, smooth aster again is another, I love asters because of the purple and um, it's a beautiful plant. Um, it's an upright plant, it's two to feet tall. It's a non-aggressive aster. Asters can be, they can spread a little bit, you, but you have to sometimes pull them up, but they're not invasive in the sense that they're just gonna go all over your yard. Like invasive is really like critters will drop seeds and carry seeds on their feet and that becomes very invasive. That's not this, they will spread out from their root systems, but they're, they're easy to pull. Blooms again, August, to October. It's really nice because there's August, so many of the plants are Absolutely. I tell you, I, August is a kind of a dry month. It's yeah. like everything's kind of dying back. Um, this is a goldenrod again, um, yellow, one to three feet tall. It's non aggressive species of goldenrod. Um, I wrote right there, not the cause of hay fever, it's like the fourth <laughs> bullet down. Um, and it's a top keystone plant, host plant. And it's an important nectar plant for the migrating monarch butterflies as they 
fly down Illinois. Rough blazing star, again, I mean, when you look at the pictures, they're really beautiful plants. They're not, you know, everybody thinks weeds, but um, they grow about two to three feet tall, bloom again, August through September. So they're late bloomers. So they're really, can really cheer up your uh, gardens in the fall. This is one of my most favorite flowers that's seen. These hyssop has purple flowers and textured foliage. It's two to feet tall. Um, pollinator magnet um, is a herb for, hyssop is a herb for cooking. The crushed leaves smell like mint and licorice. Um, it blooms July, August, September again, a wonderful long bloom season. And you will see just pollinators just oozing around them. Um, wild bergamot. Again, July, August, September, a later um, flower. Again, lavender flowers, adaptable. I'm gonna kind of move this. This is your sweet Joe pie. Now, sweet Joe pie, uh, there's a Joe pie which gets larger. We don't recommend Joe pie because it can get very large. Yeah, it's hard to find, but you can find sweet Joe pie, which is only four to six feet, feet not 10 feet, because Joe pie can grow to 10 feet. Uh, so just make sure, we don't recommend native ours usually, which is like a, a cultivar of, of native plants. It's called native R, but this is one that we do recommend a native R of. Um, wild ginger is a great native ground cover for shade. This will grow under your shadiest spots. Um, it can fend off invasive plants too. So it's great for uh, weed prevention. Um, this is going to be recorded too, isn't it, Kelly Jean? Yes. Yeah, so you can refer back to some of this stuff. So you're absolutely welcome to, you know, come back and look at this. Uh, the red twig dogwood is a wonderful plant for the winter when, you know, how much do we go into sometimes Michael's or someplace and buy those red branches? You can have them for free if you grow mm -hmm. them in your yard. Winterberry, again, is what we plant and buy for winter. It's a beautiful native holly shrub and uh, red berries and branches are often used in holiday. It grows about six feet tall. It can grow from full sun to full shade too. That's really a wonderful um, attribute. Uh, New Jersey tea is this beautiful white uh, two to three mounding flower. It's a, a flowering shrub. It's drought resistant. Um, I'm gonna have to move really fast. Vernal witch hazel. I'm just gonna go really quickly because we need to get, we're get, get running out of time. Airwood viburnum, this is a wonderful, um, uh, viburnum is a great um, uh, privet-like landscape. So you can plant those closely together and they'll grow high and it's a, a nice privacy shrub and the um, pollinators love it. Elderberry, you have to fight for the berries because they'll be gone mm -hmm. before you get to them. Um, smooth hydrangea. Now we all have hydrangeas in here and I have a ton of hydrangeas. I finally pulled out my blue hydrangeas because I never bloomed, but I have the Annabelles, which are spectacular. And remember, this is not just only native plants. You plant what you love. I love Annabelle hydrangeas. They're not the most useful plant in the world, but they're spectacular. But the smooth hydrangea is loved by um, pollinators. And as a lacy, it, you know, I don't know if you know the alien and are big full flowers. Yeah. And this is more of a cap, but I have these in the yard and they are just buzzing. The thing about native plants in a, in a yard situation is your, it becomes alive. I really had an, kind of a pretty yard before, but it was just, I'd go out there and it was nothing happening. Now it's like a flutter with butterflies, you know, bees, little, little tiny, tiny, you know, um, Shrub bees will come and hover bees come and it's just alive. So it's really cool that you can hear a garden out there. This is a dwarf chinkapin oak. I just want to mention this. This it, It's difficult to find, but it's a great small oak that fits into anything. Um, it can be a shrub or an oak, but it still has a number one. Keystone plant 456. What are, what are you thinking in terms of time now? Can we, can we go? Uh, we we can we close at eight, so we do have to, to have yeah. a pretty hard. Yeah, how about 15 minutes? We'll hard close. So hang in there with us if you want to see the rest of it. Um, again, 456 uh, species. I mean, it's just the number one plant in the in the world. Um, Eastern redbud is a great flowering um, 
pink blooms, 15 to 30 feet tall, part shade to shade, which is cool. So it can be an understory of a larger tree. Serviceberry is a beautiful airy shrub or small tree. These are all um, just wonderful, wonderful plants. Again, this is the majestic oak. Just a beautiful tree. Red maple, 40 to 60 feet. Keystone plant again. It's one of just the most important plants out there. The spring flowers are very important food source. I have silver maples in my backyard, but never grow. So I mean, my it was used to be put in all of it because they were cheap and they grew. But I did. I have to tolerate them because of the whirly birds, and they're not my my property. But um, I did find a way to deal with it because I just hated <laughs> spring. There, it's a great feed. They like. <laughs> There, they have little blooms on them and the pollinators are, it's a great food source. So now I don't hate them so much. <laughs> uh, birch tree, you know, the stunning bark of a birch tree. Oh, yeah. It's a keystone plant. Um, so overall native plants are beautiful and many look stunning in traditional landscapes. So you saw the pictures. Uh, we want to plant them for their aesthetic value, but we need to plant them for their ecosystem value. So native plants are for containers too, for those who are living in, um, with a patio or a balcony. <clears throat> so um, these are some really useful, you can do like a thriller, which is a focal point, a spiller and filler. Um, do you have a camera? Do you want me to take a picture of this for you, of this slide? Then you can have that. Can you share this this slideshow with us so I can can email it out to yes, people? absolutely. Um, on your spaces, there's a little survey. If you guys want to include your emails on that survey, if you've not already registered, I, I might have your email already if you registered, and I can send a copy of, of these slides as well. Yes. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, I just ask that you don't share them with anybody, but you know, there's per yeah. for your personal use, please. Thank you. Um, so this is really good. But the one other thing I want to talk about is that our beautiful non-native annuals too, that are very useful for nectar for our pollinators. That's lantana, cosmos, zinnias, and alyssum. The nectar is just powerful and they will flock to it for feeding purposes. Um, so and the other thing to do is create a pollinator friendly habit. And that is removing invasive plant species. Um, that's hard. That's hard to get people to do. But if you can, if they're dying, remove them and don't plant them again. How's that for uh, negotiation? Um, this site we talked about, it's the most highly invasive plant in our area. It's the calorie pear. It hosts to no caterpillar. It provides no value to our native pollinators and birds. It's ranked second only to habitat destruction as a threat to biodiversity, second. And we have them all over here because the landscapers loved them. Nobody knew. No, homeowners did not knew. No, and, and when they first, they were actually imported and nobody thought they were going to um, uh, cross-pollinate. And something came in and they cross-pollinated and produced these bad berries. And they used to not do that. And then the berries have been spread by the birds. So they were sterile when they first came into this country. And, uh, but they're no longer sterile. How did they get not sterile? Just well, just for yeah. nature, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yep, nature figured it out, you know, yeah. yes. Okay. Do you have any suggestions about how best to remove a woods full of Japanese honeysuckle. Acres of it. Where? Norway. My husband's woods grows. Oh. Hunts it. He tries so hard to get rid of all the honeysuckles. Oh, boy, that's a tough. You, and they you grow know, faster than he can. You probably down. need to do a burn. They still grow. They still grow even with a burn. The yeah, rhizomes. the rhizomes. Uh, and the only and the only thing that you can do is poison the earth, and you don't want to do that. No, no. so because this is for the deer. Yeah, or, yeah. I know that's a tough that's that's a tough call because you know you can probably remove or thin it out, but it'll always grow back. I mean that is the problem when we got 
invasive plants is that they take over everything. Yeah. They, they just take over everything. And then you have to have, I mean, a crew go in there, which would be out of sight expense yes. and, and yeah. bulldoze it up and oh. can't do that unless you poison oh. it. And that's, yeah. I'm not recommending that at all. So um, again, we talked about, yeah, it's really a tough, tough thing. Um, it, we talked about all this banning, states are banning, beginning to ban it in this soft wood. And actually it's the early spring. If you, we don't, it's too cold here for a lot of our walks in early spring, but if you go under calories, pears, they don't have a great odor. Yeah, they smell yeah, terrible. They yeah, they, yeah. They're terrible. So why? I don't know if it, because they, they were a white flowering tree, yes. landscape, landscape tree. That's why they yeah, became exactly. popular. All right, but there are great alternatives and that's the service berry, which, which we talked about, which is a white flowering tree and a flowering dogwood. So those are both native plants. Um, okay, this is the other one that every, a lot of people have, burning bush. Um, beautiful red color. I mean, everybody just sees that beautiful red and loves them, but they're very aggressive seedlings. They form dense thickets like the honeysuckle. It's the top cash crop with a $16 billion ornamental. So, but states are beginning to ban because it's all in our forests and natural lands. It's listed as an invasive species in 21 states. And it has no wild life benefit except attractive to deer. So you want deer in your yard, plant some of those. <laughs> so it's some really pretty alternatives. If you want the red fall co uh, color is chokeberry and arrowwood by Burnham, which we talked about as a great hedge plant. Um, so this is what you, you need to do is you need to choose nectar plants that provide pollen and nectar. Most of them, uh, for, uh, there are some that we talked about that provide both, but sometimes you're only gonna get nectar and the later bloomers. Um, the early spring flowers are the, you know, and summer flowers are pollinators. Include some butterfly and moth host plants. Minimize hybrid or native cultivars. You can see that when you have, uh, say it says hyssop, on it, or what's an, a, uh, I'm, I'm losing it, um, Black Eyed Susan. And then underneath there's a parentheses, you know, two apostrophes. Yellow Delight is the name. That is a native R or a cultivar, absolutely not useful. Mm -hmm. So when you look at your native plants, make sure there's no, it's not a native R because it will not provide the benefit. It should just have the Black Eyed Susan and the Latin name on it. Oh, interesting. So it has like a catchy name on it. It's not, 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 not no, catchy. it's not good. <laughs> no, no, no catchy, perfect pink or anything like that sort of thing. That's uh, plant in clusters rather than single specimens. Reduce the size of your lawn if you can. Um, nobody's saying take out your lawns. We have children, we have pets. You're not going to take out lawns. Um, some people will if they choose to, but it's not something that, you know, as moder moderators or moderation people that we're touting, you need some lawn if you'd like it. Um, and we talked about this earlier, a variety of spring, summer, and fall blooming plants. Um, avoid the use of pesticides and herbicides. The other thing to avoid is using landscape, fabric, rock, or thick mulch. We think that pre prevents weeds you have to overwinter insects. They drop into the soil. They overwinter in the soil. They cannot get through landscape fabric. They die. They cannot get through our river rock that we're notorious for um, or thick mulch. I recommend leaf mulch and um, it's, it's hard to find. Homer Glenn does mulch, does carry it. Um, and what I would recommend is that, remember I say you don't have to work so hard in the fall Rake your leaves off of your lawn into your beds. And if you don't have landscape fabric or rocks or anything, a lot of that will disintegrate. Or if you want to mulch up your leaves and toss them in your beds, then you'll start developing leaf mulch. However, I don't recommend uh, mowing them too much, although the leaf mulch that we buy is probably ground up because a lot of um, insects are pupating in there. But if you get a base of leaf mulch and you might have to chop that up, then add just the leaves and they will disintegrate and you'll have wonderful, 
wonderful soil and wonderful nutrition and great. Wait until Mother's Day for your first lawn mow if you can. That is starting to go out in the suburbs. A few suburbs are saying don't because our, our, our pollinators are in there. They're insects. They need to uh, grow in there and then don't mow your lawn right away. Um, wait until spring. We talked about this. They overwinter in old stems. And light pollution is a big problem. Um, so what we recommend is um, the night skies, the birds um, migrate with our night skies, and especially in the fall and in March. And when we put a lot of lights out, they just get disoriented and they do a lot of crashing and dying. Um, so you can have lights, but if you can, turn them off after 10 o'clock, unless somebody's out, or you have it facing down. So they're not upright or all around. So they just go down. You have light there because you can see people that you can see, we've done, they've done studies to show that you will see people enough, but look at that for your lights. Don't have a million lights on because we birds get, do they? Yeah. Great. So yeah, I'll, I'll catch you in one minute. Just in the past, this is Doug Talley again. So hopefully that book goes out today. Um, in the past, we have asked one thing of our gardens that they be pretty. Now we have to support life, sequester carbon and feed pollinators and manage water. They're just critical now. And we can do it. And that's a pollinator corridor, corridor between our natural lands. Be between them should be our yards and our gardens. So they have a place to go. Um, and every plant counts every plant. So if you can start with three, that's great. It's just better to cluster in threes. If you can have 18, that's better. If you can have masses amount, that's just uh, wonderful. Uh, corridors allow the pollinators to migrate through our yards, down to other climates, and avoid threats such as pesticides. So if you have neighbors using pesticides, you might see more pollinators in your garden because they're escaping. Um, this is a cool thing, Homegrown National Park. You might want to put this on or, or, or they're, they're going to get the slides. This is Doug Tallamy's idea. He's just a brilliant, it's a grassroots call to action. If you have one foot by one foot, a container in your patio of native plants, you can get yourself on the map, on Doug Tallamy's map. The goal is to add 20 million acres of native plantings in the US. 90% of our land in the United States is owned privately. It is not, even with our big national parks, it's privately owned land. So we have to do something about this. Every plant counts and you can get on the map, even if you have three plants and you'll have a little bug. But so Sag Marine, which you have the um, uh, website on the brochures, you can send us your photos and you can, uh, visit our website. It's a wonderful, there's lots of articles, et cetera. We have webinars every, um, we have webinars uh, every four to six weeks. So check that out, sign up for emails if you want. So you're welcome to do that. So, but don't pull anything out if you love it. It, it's, it keeps the weed control and you can control it and it's not going all over your neighbor's yard, then it's, you know, do what you love, but I, mostly native if you can. <laughs> New plants, plant native. Thank you so much for your attention. It was great to be with you. You're a very interactive crowd and I appreciate that. Thank you.